John Steele was taught Pilates directly by Joe in Joe's gym on 8th Avenue in New York from 1963 to Joe's death in 1967. John became friends with Joe and Clara and regularly ate with them at their apartment. He walked arm in arm with Joe through the streets of New York, listening to Joe's lectures, almost harangues, on Contrology, now Pilates. After Joe's death, John Steele was instrumental in the continuation of Contrology. He was instrumental in appointing Romana Krasanowska as the new teacher. And John's book, Caged Lion, relates the history of Pilates right from Joseph's mystical beginnings to the present day. Uh, It's a very powerful book and a great fun read as well. I know you're going to enjoy my conversation with John Steele. I certainly did. Well, John, it's a fantastic book. Uh, It's extremely readable. Uh, You bring the characters to life and you portray actually many of their human complexities and contradictions. Like after reading it, I actually feel I know Joe, Clara, Romana and Ron Fletcher, (laughs) um, as well as if I'd actually spent time with them. Um, It's quite... Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed. Actually, objectively, even for somebody who's not interested in Pilates, and I know everybody listening to this is interested in Pilates, but even uh, that aside, it's actually just a really well-written book. So congratulations on your first effort. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you, you paint a very vivid portrait of working out in Joe's gym and of walking arm in arm through the streets of New York, hustling people out of the way um you and also of the the kind of mostly silent and sometimes awkward dinners you spent with joe and clara um and of having lunch with romana and convincing her romancing her to take over joe's role and and ron fletcher's creative drive um you also bring to light several major inconsistencies in the received history of pilates um, and, and he managed to do so with lightness, humility, and warmth. And uh, perhaps apart from Sean Gallagher, who really comes across as thoroughly not a good person, um, no character in the book really comes across as either good or evil. They're all complex and multifaceted humans. And so it's a fantastic piece of writing as uh, well as a surprisingly insightful book, um, that a look at Joseph Pilates and his legacy. So I feel like I learned, I mean, I've been teaching Pilates for 15 years now and I feel like I learned so much from reading the book. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I want to start by asking you about the reformer. Um, the story we've all heard about Joe's invention of the reformer, you know, the only story you can find on the internet, uh, it seems, is the famous tale of how whilst he was interned on the Isle of Man during World War One, he attached bed springs to the head of the beds. Uh, but in the book, you point out several holes in that story. Um, can you can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, I mean, that was one of the clues that uh, Joe was making this up, and. It also gives you a little bit of insight into Joe. He had this bizarre sense of humor, uh, the, uh, which which uh, which sometimes got him to tell these absolutely ridiculous stories with a totally straight face. In fact, that's the only face I ever saw, and and I think that was one of them. I mean, wh- when you think, well. Let me start with the patent, because that is really the biggest insight into uh, the reformers' uh, creation. When you look at the uh, patent drawing, uh, you see a, a reformer, a moving bed, high up uh, and on a platform, and it, it instead of springs at the what you'd call the foot of it, there are 
uh, weights on pulleys. And the reason it's high up is to get movement of the, of, of the carriage, uh, the three or four feet that it does have to move, you needed to have the weights able to descend and go up three or four feet, and they had to be, uh, or at least in Joe's patent thinking, it had to be below the, uh, the carriage. Uh, I don't, as an engineer, I, I don't understand why that was, but that's how the drawing was. And there's one picture which I have not been able to find, although I know I saw it once, of uh, the reformer in that uh, configuration with weights pulling the carriage uh, one way uh, toward the foot, uh, where there's a ladder which you climbed up uh, to get on the reformer. And the picture shows someone lying on the reformer and an instructor on the ladder helping that person, uh, coaching him, because the instructor in the patent drawing would be standing uh, literally below this structure. So you see this completely unworkable uh, piece of machinery with uh, weights. And you read the claims, and uh, the patent was first uh, prosecuted in Germany, and then it was pretty much literally translated, I'm told, into the American version. The claims, which are the essence of a patent, it's what the inventor claims as his or her invention. The claims talk about a carriage that is moved by the gravity on the weights. All right, now that's in 1927, the year Joe did uh, arrive in New York. And so obviously he had thought of this uh, sometime before. If you read through to the end of the patent and past the time of the, uh, of the, uh, past the section on claims and at the end of the section on description of the invention, there is a line that says other uh, devices could be used to move the carriage, including springs. So the idea of springs, it, it, obviously in 1926 or 1927, long after his incarceration, uh, it was basically gravity weights uh, and springs was the uh, kind of alternate thought. Hey, you could use springs kind of thought. Now, did he ever make the reformer on, on that structure? No, it, it couldn't work. Number one in New York because he'd never find a gym or studio with the ceiling high enough to accommodate it. And they thought of, you know, his clients or patients or customers going up and down this ladder and then having an instructor going up and down this ladder, uh, uh, completely unworkable. But he did make one with long springs. And those are the reformers that basically remain functionally identical to the ones he did make back in the late 20s, early 30s in New York. Now, if you look at those little bed springs, they're, you know, maybe, what, an inch, two inches. Uh, they're only there uh, to hold the straps with some degree of flexibility, completely unworkable idea. And Joe was very mechanical. So when, when he came up with this thought, what was in his head? 
he certainly couldn't believe that anyone would accept this uh, and that everyone would treat it as some kind of a bizarre joke. But they did accept it. No one questioned it till I came along or someone else, maybe Ken Edelman questioned it because he's done quite a bit of research and he's also got some of the original ish reformers. Uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, the Springs, uh, uh, and then of course, uh, later uh, when people asked him about this, why you Springs, he did have explanations for it, which uh, from an engineering point of view, stand up extremely well. The spring increases the resistance the further it is stretched. So that's the guts of the spring. And that's what he actually wanted. He wanted so that if you pushed it uh, six inches, you exerted, uh, pick a number, 30 foot pounds of effort. Uh, totally made up on my head right now. But if you wanted to go another six inches, it would take 60 foot pounds. And that's what he wanted so that you would, the further you stretched it, the harder you had to work. And the more you uh, presumably uh, got out of it. But, and that's the beauty of the reformer and the great difference between it and so many weight-based exercises where the resistance remains the same no matter how far uh, you push it. It's only a matter of, uh, of, of distance in your effort. In, in this, he got the double whammy of... Uh, of, of the further you pushed it, the increasingly more difficult it became. And you had to concentrate more. Your mind had to be completely focused on what you were doing because you felt, you felt that spring starting to fight you harder and harder. But the bed spring idea is so crazy that, you know, I, I I don't know. I'm not saying he did it to kid people. He may have done it on the spur of the moment uh, when he was confronted with someone. It said, hey, how'd you invent the, the reformer? And I don't know how he invented the reformer, but he, he had an answer for that and that was all. Oh, it was when I was in the prison. I had the bed springs. <laughs> no, they may work on the uh, toe corrector. That's about the size of. Actually, the springs on those are about four times the length of the springs of 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 cot bed spring. But the other thing about it, forget the absurdity of it. There were no beds in, uh, no cots in, in, uh, on the island uh, uh, of man. There were no cots whatsoever. They slept on straw pallets, on, you know, burlap bags filled with straw. And not, and that wasn't a torture by the British. There were no cots anywhere. Bed springs had not been invented for, that kind of things till into the thirties. So, you know, these were the things, if I can go on a minute, these were the things that when I, I started picking apart his story that, you know, they were jolting. They were, wait, wait a minute. If he, if he, he went that far to disguise what happened and went that far in his life to disguise his previous life, that that's interesting. That's telling you something about him and his past, which, you know, I could, I couldn't uncover. No one uncovered it so far and no one will, I don't think, but 
it, it tells you about him and it, it, it gave me, <laughs> it actually made me s start to appreciate him more <laughs> rather than less. And that's kind of a contrary a thing in life. Normally when somebody pulls your leg and really teases you and fools you and lies to you, you start to get a little suspicious. But in my case, it, uh, it told me ab about him. And I liked it. In many ways, uh, you know, the way you portray him, he was an enigma. And uh, he, you know, I had accepted that bedspring story unquestioningly as well. And now when you pointed it out in the book, I was like, of course, that's totally ridiculous. Bedsprings are like two inches long and very, very stiff. They're like, they're not very extensible. Whereas the springs on a reformer are like two feet long and they extend out to three or four times, you know, three or four feet long so it's like how could you possibly use bed springs and then I, I actually looked it up on wikipedia after i read the book and it's like you're right bed springs were not really in widespread use until the 1930s so it's like they it's totally impossible from all <laughs> from all angles <laughs> it's it's obviously a fabrication and and i can't believe that he, like you say it must have been like to pull people's legs or something because I can't believe that anybody who knew bed springs and knew a reformer could actually believe that at the time. But yet I've believed it for the last 15 years. <laughs> well, that's right. He, he had, uh, I mean, as I, as I say, it, it tells you about Joe in a way. He had this uncanny ability to get you to believe all kinds of things. And it, it actually helped greatly in how he taught. He, you, you, you gave in to him. You stopped questioning him. And he, he took away that, that, what, I don't know, right or left side of your brain that's always saying, you know, what the hell is this guy telling me? Why is he telling me this? He took it away. And it, from the start, which I talked about in the beginning, I mean, I, I walked into him with nothing positive in my whole mind. All I, all I was thinking is he is a major fraud. He's a charlatan. This is just one of my mother's, weird, you know, obsessions. And, uh, and uh, within minutes, he took that away. How he did it, I don't know. But he got you to do what he wanted you to do by stopping you questioning what you were doing. You, all you had to do to make him uh, pleased, and you couldn't tell he was pleased, was just give in. And once you did that, it was great for you, and he knew that you did it. He knew you weren't reacting to all the strange stuff he was asking you to do, which, you know, today it's not so strange. Millions and millions of people are doing it. When I did it, I'd never seen anything like this equipment before. I'd never heard, I never had any idea that people exercise like this. And it, it was strange, but he, he got me to follow. And I think in that, there is a huge lesson for everyone who not only teaches Pilates, but who teaches anything that for you to learn, you've got to turn off something in your head that we need in life. I mean, you can't go through life unquestioning anything, <laughs> but when you're trying to learn, if you, all you do is question what's in front of you as you're trying to learn simultaneously, you're doomed.
But if you say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do exactly what he says. It sounds crazy, looks crazy, but hell, I'm going to do it. And then afterwards, if you want to say, wait a minute, what the hell was that all about? It's like the bed springs, actually. He got you to believe it was the bed springs and you didn't question it. You didn't question it. Why? Because you, yeah, you want, uh, what, you didn't care that much and you wanted to believe him and all this. And you had other things to question and this and that. And so you didn't question it. So you accepted it. So you learned it. You actually had in your mind, if someone got you on the street and say, hey, by the way, Raphael, I hear you got you teach Pilates, you've got a reformer, and it's got, where do you get the idea of springs? You would have said bed springs. <laughs> because why not? But once I had to write this down and put it on paper, that wasn't good enough anymore. It just wasn't. I couldn't say, oh, bed spring. No, wait a minute. That's crazy. And once that happens, of course, you unravel everything and you go back. So there is this thing. I mean, I'm not a, a, a professor of how to teach, but there is this thing in his teaching method that, stopped the questioning that 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 ask you to believe just believe for a minute take it from me if you do these exercises if you re read his book that's what his book's all if you do these exercises the way i'm telling you to do them right now you're going to be far better off you're going to be happier just do them. Just do them. Don't think about it. Don't write notes. Don't don't memorize what I'm telling you. Just do what I'm telling you to do, and you will benefit. Just do it. And there is uh, something to that. And I think teachers should be ra rather sensitive when when one of their clients starts to say, well, why are you making me do that? Or why are you making me, you know, put my toes together, or my heels together? Why? What's it doing? That's a signal that they're not giving in to you, that they're not listening to you. They're not respecting you. And you've got to go backwards and try to figure out why. Why aren't they trusting me at this point? All I'm doing is trying to tell, help them exercise their body in a very important, good way. And, you know, I think that's a, a, a lot, a, 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 a very important part of, of teaching Pilates. I, I would agree. It is. What you, and uh, I want to go, um, in a minute, I want to get into your notions of flow and why why it's important to surrender. But um, before we before we go there, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Joseph's teaching style because you know one of the themes in the book is you you attempt to tease out the 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 different effects of Joe's kind of magnetic personality and teaching style um, from actually controlology that that transcended him and and went beyond him um, and so could we could could you just tell us a little bit um, about his teaching like w one of the things that really struck me uh, and is uh, when you said in the in the book during the, the first part of the book where, where you discussed Joe is that during your sessions together like I think you said something like in thousands of instructions he gave you you know, on, on moving, he never once referred to a body part by its anatomical name, you know. Um, so uh, so what kind of instructions did Joe give? And, uh, yeah, and how much instruction did he give? Very uh, sparse oral instructions. No 
demonstration ever. Uh, and what would he say? For example, let's let's do let's talk about the legwork at the beginning of the reformer routine. Push the legs out. Period. That was it. It, you know, he didn't spend a lot of time with how f- Pilates V. There was no such thing as Pilates V. He would say, spread the toes, heels together, push the legs out. That was it. Except for one other thing, which you're very interested in. Breeze in. Breeze the air in or breeze the air out. But that's all it was. And you would do it for uh, uh, 10 times usually, but sometimes four, three. He'd make it up as he as he'd watch you exercise. But it, it was, or sometimes, uh, for example, uh, oh, let's do the teaser. Extremely hard to teach, right? Very hard. So he would get you on the a long box on the reformer. You'd be lying there, and uh, you'd have your arms next to your body, and you would be holding uh, the leather straps, the handles, right? And he would have the uh, l- very light springs, but enough. So, so he would just say, "Pick up the legs, pick up the body," and that's that's all. He didn't tell you to squeeze your glutes and work on your core and yeah. He never told you what muscles to use or where to exert the energy. He told you where he wanted you to go. And and you would struggle and you would struggle. And he he didn't help you. He didn't he just watched you struggle and You'd struggle for a few times, and then he'd move you to the next exercise without a word. So if you just got your feet your feet up a little and you got your head and your chest up a little and, you know, your arms were straight, that was fine. he just let it go. Next time, you'd actually start to do better. Or, or if he saw you, like, bending your arms and trying to do you know, get the strength out of your elbows, he'd say, slide the arms. And that was it. But you never did anything wrong. You never did anything badly. You never disappointed him in any way. And he wouldn't let you disappoint yourself. So if you lay on that long box and you raised your feet one inch, and your chest one inch off that box, which is probably what I would be doing now <laughs> at my age. No, I can do a little better, but not much. Uh, at any rate, th- uh, that was fine as long as he felt you were focused and trying to do it. And that was fine. And there's a lot to that in, in teaching. There is, in, and yeah, and it's uh, it's to me it's it's quite astonishing. Like I've read his his book, of course, and you know you say in the book that that he says oh, I'm forty years ahead of my time. Uh, in fact, I think he was uh, in many ways he was he was fifty or sixty years ahead of his time because in terms of uh, the research on teaching, actually it it has now caught up with that and what he what you've described is are things called implicit learning and uh, uh, building uh, self-efficacy in in le- in learners and those things are, are strongly supported by you know recent research now and uh, yeah it's, so it's very interesting to me that he was quite prescient about those things about yeah many many, many things. And we're talking about a very uh, basic human being. He very little education, very little sophistication, very little anything, but incredible instincts. Incredible. Um, 
I, I want to just, uh, ag- again, kind of get into the nuts and bolts of uh, the routine that you learned. Because in the, uh, in the book, um, you mention that in that first session that you did with Joe in, in I think it was about 1963, three or three or thereabouts um that you you did about 50 exercises and that you know you did this you know you named many of the sequences that we're familiar with today like you said the leg work the long box the short box etc and also you named a few exercises like open leg rocker and rolling like a ball and things which are mat work exercises um, and so, and also, you know, at various points through the book, you mention, um, you know, people that the reformer was at the core of the of the workout, but that you know, when the gym was busy, you know, people would have to come and start on the Cadillac or the or the barrel or, or something until they could spot a reformer that was free, and then they would quickly jump on it. So, could you could you um, sort of explain to me what you know? Because many times you refer to the routine. You know, you, re- you learnt this, f- you know, what I would call these days like a flowing routine. You know, you said there, there are sequences of exercise, four or five exercises without really any significant adjustments or position changes. And then the, the position changes were part of the routine, you know, so it was a constantly choreographed, you know, process that you just had to kind of slip into. And so how did, you know, switching between the reformer and the mat and the Cadillac or the the barrel, you know, how did, how did, what, what did a routine look like? Well, yeah, uh, you know, it's funny, this has been asked in, in, in very different ways because uh, modern uh, studio, you know, uh, shifts people between equipment. Some da- some days you've got a reformer equipment exercise. Some day barrel chair and all that, and and you go from one to the other as a distinct thing. The the goal of for everyone who went into the studio was to do a reformer routine. And that was the goal. I don't know anyone who ever went there to do a mat or a chair or a Cadillac or anything. If you couldn't do that, there were only four or five uh, reformers and a rush hour, lunch hour, early, early in the morning, late in the day, uh, they were, they were busy. So you would, just go where you could find a spot uh, where you may be comfortable. Now, the the mat w- was, there were a few things, it was almost like breakfast, you know. <laughs> there were a few things you did first and a few things you did uh, last. And, and, and uh, the last, well, maybe it was dinner. The last is like dessert. So you rarely did the barrel ladder first. You rarely did it because that was a stretch at the end. It was a relaxing lying over the barrel. And the same with the Cadillac and, you know, the trapeze and hanging. And they were more of, uh, let's stretch out at the end. And you could do that even if you just finished the reformer. So what you try to do first was always the mat that when you couldn't get on a reformer and you would do the mat and you would do it pretty much uh, as, as it is in, excuse me, (coughs) in return to life. You just, you had a routine. Uh, yes, open leg rocking and there were leg circles and two leg, uh, you know, both leg circles. And it was a whole routine, which I don't remember because I never uh, liked it that much. And no one really does. But, uh, uh, but the minute the reformer opened up, if you were, you know, halfway through, the map was only a half hour, I think. That's about all it took you to get through that. So if you're 15 minutes through the mat, you started on the reformer the way you always would. And 
in terms of no break, absolutely. You had a towel. You were obligated, and it was a gringy, sweaty towel. It was your little towel. But you had to wipe down the mat, not to sterilize it, but to get your sweat or to dry it. And then you went right over to the reformer and put your towel down uh, on the reformer and lay down on the reformer. You started your legwork and you went through that routine as if you'd started there when you walked into the gym. And that's how it was. There was no break. You, it, when you got up from the, from the mat, number one, you weren't going to take a chance. And someone else is going to take your reformer. So you went over there. And you couldn't have water. There was no water to have in the gym. No one had bottled water or that stuff. There was no water cooler. Yeah, there was no water. And so you went straight over there. You got down on the reformer. And, you know, you couldn't lay your towel down on it and then walk away, go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, sir. So they'd be on you for that. And and so some days you, you would have a, a longer workout or you'd come in, the reformer was empty, get on it, do your reformer, maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes, depending, you know, how quickly you moved and whether there were alternative things you did. Uh, uh, and then maybe you wanted to hang on the trapeze or, or, or uh, do the guillotine or do the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the foot thing, but, or hang Pedipole. over the barrel. Pardon me? The pedipole. The pedipole, yeah. You could do some of that. And, uh, that's if you felt good, but if you didn't go in the shower and you know get dressed, go home or uh, work. You, yeah, so you stress you know many times through the book that Joe's goal was for you know for the workout to become for you to become self sufficient with the workout, and that he was you know when you first went in there, he would teach you the workout so that you could do it yourself without him standing over you the whole time. And so, and, and he ran what you called an open gym. Basically people just, you know, rock up whenever and just wait till the reform is free and then jump on and then go till you're done and then wipe it and have your shower and go home. And uh, it, one other thing that you, you mentioned in there that intrigued me, it was just a single, single line that you mentioned that uh, Joe visualized, you know, large classes. We said, I think with the leader calling out the names of the exercises through a megaphone, um, so, you know, can you tell me any more about that vision? Well, I, 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 not much more. I mean, he, I think he, he talked about the whole world doing this. This was like human medicine. This was like water or brushing your teeth. This was something that was necessary for human life, uh, particularly city life. And he, he didn't really work out how it could happen. That was one of the problems, I think, not unique to any inventor. They're, they're very good at seeing the end, but it, it takes a lot of hard work to, just, to see the steps to get there. And he didn't. So, yeah, I think he, you know, he did know about the Chinese and the Japanese uh, doing exercises in the park, mass exercises, because someone told him. And he did know, I think, about uh, uh, German group exercises, which were quite extensive and there may have been even exercises in groups at, at the prison uh, where he claims to have led them and all that and there is no evidence that he did but there's no one around saying he didn't either so he may have uh, and he did lead 
a big group exercises up up in uh, Massachusetts at that is or New Hampshire wherever it is up, up there. Yeah, near Jacob's Pillow. His house was not in Jacob's Pillow, but close by. And he did lead uh, groups of exercises up there. Sometimes in in the snow, he'd get everyone out with hard, you know, people would come up on the weekend. And sometimes there were dance companies that were up there for some reason. And he'd get them over there and they'd march out in the goddamn snow and stand there and he'd get them moving and happy and feeling great. And he'd make you rub the snow on yourself and all that. And uh, so he had that in, in his mind, but of course he, he didn't take any steps even to get it past his gym. I mean, he didn't go out and find Corolla or Kathy Grant or uh, um, uh, uh, the, some of the names slip, slip my mind. They got him. They went to him and said, hey, we'd like to learn how to do this. And he, well, all right, all right, all right. I mean, he was not enthusiastic about it. So he had this vision of the whole world doing it, but he had he didn't get from A to Z. He had nothing in between, nothing. He really had a build it and come sort of uh, mentality to it. You know, he had what a build it and they will come sort of mentality. Uh, yeah, right. He did, and he was right. They, they did. They just took forty years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about Clara as a teacher? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit. <laughs> That's the extent of what I can tell you. Yeah, okay. Uh, there, there's, there's, it, 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 it's not an easy uh, uh, question to answer for me because I, Joe was my teacher, and after Joe died, uh, Clara would definitely come into the studio on West 56th Street, but she always stood in the background. She deferred entirely to Romana, and Romana was a very active, all-over-the-floor uh, kind of uh, uh, teacher. She was with everyone all the time and Clara would stand in the background. So she didn't teach. And maybe if she observed something that Romana was doing that she didn't like, she would speak to Romana afterwards. But I think the probability of that is teeny because Romana was extremely hard to talk to about things like that. And Clara was definitely ex reserved. Now, before, when she was in the studio, she was much more of a person that would uh, jump to uh, someone's assistance when they're really hung up, when they didn't know what to do, when they had, it, were doing something wrong, they crossed the straps, or let's say the headpiece was up with the long box was on it, or when they're pushing the carriage and it was squeaking and she knew why, because it was offset, they were pushing it unequally. I unequally, unequally, I don't know. Anyhow, uh, but she rarely, uh, and I shouldn't say rarely, I never saw her uh, start with a new uh, a client or patient or, or customer, whereas John, Bob Seed, Hannah, they could do that. Uh, if two people... Uh, 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 at, at the beginner stage, if I was one of them and there was another real beginner at the exact same time, uh, it, let's say in the morning, Joe would be completely uh, 
uh, uh, involved with me, and Bob Seed would take care of the other person until they got, you know, until they got going. And then Joe would kind of, you know, move over into them. But Clara never did that job ever. So I don't know, except for one thing, Ron Fletcher and Ron Fletcher loved Clara. And that was not only a credit to Clara, and that was his reaction to Joe based on what he thought was Joe's reaction to him. He didn't like Joe. He thought Joe did not like uh, flamboyant uh, gay guys, and he was extremely flamboyant. And so he was very resistant to Joe teaching him, and Clara saved him, uh, uh, literally. I mean, she saw that problem. She knew Joe's feelings about certain men. I don't think he had them about any women, but he did have them about certain men. He just reacted to them. And she went in and helped him at the beginning, but he was extremely talented, uh, gifted, knew his body cold, had great ability to remember a choreography. And so he, he moved along pretty quickly. Uh, and he, he didn't need much from Clara because he, he had it within him to, to, to do it correctly. But uh, he, he just thought Clara was great. So uh, I can't answer the question. It, had she been left alone when she was 60 years old and had great vision, let's say in 1935 or something, and could she have taught people? Maybe, but not when Joe was in the studio. He he, he took all the air out of the place. Yeah, his personality was very uh very overwhelming. Yes. Um, Joe's original uh, premises at uh, on Eighth Avenue was was a, called a gym. You know, you refer to it many times as the gym. And uh, these days, though, there's no such thing as a Pilates gym. We we have Pilates studios. And I, it had never occurred to me uh, to question that. But in the book, you highlight the specific moment when that terminology changed. Um, and it was it was basically uh, when you know when Romana took over. Um, yeah, can you can you tell us just a little bit about that transition from? I guess it, it would be the transition from you know what I think of as the contrology era to to the the you know what people commonly refer to as the classical you know era. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, I got it. I had an interview the other day on um, one question, and that is, was the feminization of Pilates. And that subject and that transition was at the core of that question. When did it stop being a gym, which has all these masculine connotations and become a studio uh, and it did occur it wasn't just Ramana it was the whole group of us when we decided we were going to reinvent ourselves in a, in a modern way because the other way Joe's way was failing and that's when we hired Ramana this was in 1972. And I think we just... Uh, this was in about yeah, 1972. Yeah, around 72. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe even a little before then when we decided what we were going to do. And, and that's what we did. We just stopped calling it a gym and started calling it a studio. But at the same time... The architecture changed, and you can see that picture in my book of, of all the people standing there and with the bust of Joe behind and the handwritten names of the people. 
the 60 56th Street studio was extremely modern. It was all white and crisp, and the floor had a very a fabulous, quirky kind of linoleum on it, and the, and the machines that Graz made were aluminum. We still had a lot of the wood machines, uh, not reformers, but we a barrel ladder and chairs. They were still and still are mostly wood. Uh, 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 and the trapeze. But the, the place really got cleaned up. It had a reception desk. It had a big sign behind it, which you could see in the photograph. You know, graphics. So that was... The first change. And along with that change came Ramana. So all of a sudden, the chief teacher was no longer a man, was a woman. And it wasn't just a woman. It was a woman that really had ballet in her bones. I mean, she was a kid. That's all she knew. And so she brought the feminine side of ballet into the studio. And it wasn't even just that. She picked as people to help her or interns or whatever she wanted to call them, young women ballet dancers. They were all young women and girls, actually. And that started to feminize it because but they dressed differently. Even Romana dressed differently. There was a certain grungy, funky, uh, cool way of dressing uh, compared to Clara, who's dressed like a, a nurse in a, in a, in a Swiss uh, a tuberculosis resort. I mean, uh, so, so it, I mean, it, it, it was a creeping thing. And then when it crept further, I mean, way after this, years and years later in the, in the 90s, it almost became like a beauty parlor. It, it, I mean, there were bit wonderful glass doors and the receptionist was all dolled up and made up and there was a registry book and appointments and a wonderful ladies locker room and men's locker rooms. So it's, it started to get very feminized. You didn't have to worry about the men the way you did the women. And the, even the machinery, the equipment started, the colors. You had a colored upholstery. You had them doing it in chartreuse and ruby red and this and that. So the whole, and of course, the dress code changed. The, the women started wearing uh, tights, fancy tights, great headbands. The whole thing just moved in that direction, which saved it. And then when Fletcher got uh, uh, people like Fonda and Raquel Welch, that too brought women there, not men. Because, yes, men would love to see Raquel Welch and see Fonda working out. But eh, that wasn't what men were really about. But women were. If Fonda could do this and look like she does, and Raquel Welch, well, I'm going there. If that'll work, I'll. Bleh. So women flocked to it. And of course, when you had uh, trendsetters like those, if if uh, if uh, Jane Fonda wore a pink and orange leotard with brown stripes, they would sell out. And the, everywhere instantly. So the whole thing really started to, to become much more like, like a beauty parlor. And women would talk like they do under the hairdryer or waiting. And it, it, it changed greatly. Now, I sense a very strong trend toward men in older 
demographics, but men are finding this or being pushed there by their girlfriends or their wives, or there's a, there's a force pushing men into Pilates. And the amazing thing, and, and I'm in a, and have been in a couple of men's groups. The amazing thing is that they love it and they become, at least for two of the men I, I know, they're, they're insistent that their wives go. I mean, they go, but they, you've got to go. <laughs> what? You got a cold? Don't worry about it. Go. I mean, they're, they're very, they're very, very enthusiastic, very pushy, and they see it in terms of just what Joe wanted them to see health, happiness better posture, moving through life better. That Men see it exactly that way. And talk about it. That way, oh, this is saving me. Oh, this is great. Boy, do I feel better. Women, when they leave the studios, you know, well, when is your daughter getting married? Do you like the guy? Uh, yeah, I did lemon meringue pilot. <laughs> it's different. It really is. You can argue all you want that I'm, you know, a sexist, whatever it is. But the fact is, it's different. And men are coming back to it, uh, appreciating the care they get there and uh, appreciating its effect. Uh, uh, I'm encouraged about that. Um, something I've long struggled with personally is reconciling what I read in Return to Life, um, where Joe you know, never mentions the core or the powerhouse. Uh, and in fact, he specifically states that Contrology is not for developing, I think he says something like, you know, this or that pet set of muscles, um, you know, but rather the uniform development of the body and the mind as a whole. Um, and, you know, reconciling that with the notion of the powerhouse being the core of everything, in Pilates that's become really embedded so deeply in uh, in Pilates, you know, law. Um, when you relate the story of the court case in, in 2001, um, you shed a lot of light on that for me. So um, uh, I think you, you said something like uh, the, the judge described Pilates as a, a method of conditioning incorporating... Uh, specific exercises um, designed right. to strengthen the entire body, especially the lower back and abdominal region while right. stretching or something like that. And, 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 and you relate, basically, you, you, you imagine Joe, you know, in court standing up and, and objecting strenuously <laughs> to that <laughs> definition. Can, can you talk me through that, please? Yeah. Uh, it, Romana did that period. Uh, I really could end there. And it did get picked up. Uh, I don't know. I, I only, I don't know, you know, what I never went to a session with Corolla or uh, Kathy Grant or, uh, or Sam Miguel. I, I never did. So I don't know how they taught, but I can't, imagine them doing that uh, core and powerhouse. Romana loved it. She just loved it. Powerhouse was oh, her thing. And, uh, you know, Joe, Joe, Joe saw, he saw the human body as a massively interconnected bundle of exercises, tendons, nerves. There was no one part that, that had any predominance to more importance or did more than any other part. Everything worked, had to work together all the time. And 
And when he, you know, the street scene, when he saw people on the street, the slightest little thing that they did that was out of symmetry or asymmetrical or even sometimes awkward, swinging an arm differently, maybe an inch. If you walked and you swung your right arm an, an inch further forward than your left, he saw that. Uh, and he didn't relate it to a powerhouse or a core. He related it to, he'd see that and he'd say, well, why the hell is that happening in his head? And he would actually follow it around through the body. He'd say, oh, it's happening because the guy is sticking his left foot out more to the left then he sticks his right foot to the right when he walks or he's pointing his toe differently or he's doing, and he traces it all. The, so he has to swing his right arm out a little further to keep his balance because he's unbalanced right on the ground. And he, he didn't see things like the core and the powerhouse and the this and the that. If your head was a little off, he he, he didn't say, oh, this guy's head's a little off. I'm going to have to tell him to straighten it up. No, he said his head is off because there's a reason. Why does he walk with his head like that? And he, or why does he do the reformer and try to move his head one way? Or why is he, why is one shoulder an inch away from the shoulder rest and the other is pushing really hard? Uh, or one leg. So he, he would see this total connection. And of course, then he extrapolated it to the mind. But the point is, Romanus saw it like training a ballet dancer or getting a ballet dancer to do a certain move. And I think, and I, from ballet, I know nothing. So, except I love to watch it uh, and have for years and years. But uh, I, I think how you teach ballet must have relate to Picking, telling someone to pick a part of their body, put, get your shoulders back, get your this, that, do this, do that. It's all pieces of your body. Joe didn't do any of that. Your body was not a piece, it, uh, a pieces. It was a piece. And uh, uh, that's sort of my comment on why it's stuck is because it's easier. It's easier. It's much easier to tell someone oh, uh, 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 fire up or whatever you use uh, to get your muscles go. Fire up your core, uh, get your glutes involved, you know, trigger your glutes. It's easier. He didn't do that. He never told you what, what muscle to use. He told you where he wanted your body to go. And <laughs> you had to figure it out. And that's the mind-body connection. Well, um, I've, I've only got two more questions for you, and I'm I'm very grateful for the time that you're spending. Um, but I d I do want to ask you. You, you do know I'm enjoying this, right? Oh, all right, great. Well, Good. I'm enjoying it a lot too. Um, you you draw a parallel, which I think is a very apt one, um, between uh, Pilates and software, and you say that Pilates, you know, in Joseph's time. Pilates was a proprietary system, um, but now it's open source. And you even sort of draw a parallel with Apple computers and when they, in their early days, they wouldn't release the source code to anybody. And, but then they found that they had to, uh, you know, give the source code to app developers so that the app developers could build apps for the Apple platform so then everybody could enjoy it and the platform would grow. And you'd really draw a convincing, I think, parallel with Pilates. Can you, can you tell us about that, about the... Yeah, how, I guess how that how you see that enabled the popularity of Pilates today. Well, yeah, so, and that's an, uh, also an important thing. One of my sub goals in the book was to, in a way, iron out this issue of classical versus 
everything else. And I mean, I appreciate the interest in classical. I think there's always a great benefit to trying to go back to the source code, so to speak, and get get at the heart of what he did. Uh, but uh, if if the rule had to be that everybody who was going to call what they did Pilates had to teach it, if you look in the court context, in the Romana tradition, but if you look in what the classicists and even Romana claim in the Joe tradition, and that I just want to add is a false claim, but in the Romana tradition, who, who would want to do this? Who would want to teach it? Where would it go? If Bach had written all of his music and insisted that it had to be played on a harpsichord with an orchestra like the orchestra they had then, on a wood flute with one key, would we have Bach today? Would we have Beethoven today? Would we have anything today? Who knows? I mean, it, 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 it's an absurdity to think that, that you could bring a huge number of people not only to do it, but to teach it. Uh, people that want to teach this do it for what I think are extremely elevated, high motives. They want to help people. They they love motion. They 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 like the physical body. They like this, but they also have within them. Let's if a good part of them are dancers. They have an artistic side, or let's say a non commercial side. They they have creativity within them. They want to feel creative. Even when they were dancers, they want to create something when they're dancing. So to say to them, oh, hell, he invented or Ramana and had this choreography. You got to stick to it for the rest of your life. This is it. This Pilates, everything else, well, if you teach that crap, don't do it. It's no good. Terrible, bad won't help anyone. So you can't do that. So the breakthrough was like on several scores. One was that Fletcher, by really smashing the whole notion of you have to do it this way, brought fun to it. It was fun to go to Pilates. It was fun to have him teach you. It was fun to use a red towel. It was just a whole great time. And you still had to concentrate. You still had to work hard. You, you didn't laugh. You weren't having a margarita uh, while you were doing it. You, you were busy. But he brought this notion of oh, let's do something that when you move, you'll have fun doing it. Okay. So, and then when he started to actually lecture to people who were teaching or run workshops, he, he was the first to do that. The people took from him that enthusiasm for creativity and they said, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this because, gee, you know, I've got some ideas. I've got some thoughts on some are good, some are bad. Let's try it. Let's see. And then you got people like Elizabeth Larkin, who all she wanted to do was fix broken people. That's what she wanted to do in life. And 
and so she worked at St. Francis in uh, in San Francisco, and she brought all kinds of thinking and new ideas and all that. So what what's made Pilates what it is today is the creativity, the energy. Uh, it's a dedication of thousands and thousands of teachers. And that it goes into the students. That's why students come back. They like the teachers. They feel like coming back to them. They'll never feel what, what Joe's concentration made me feel. He's gone. They'll never feel what Romana's particular dedication to doing things a certain way and her ability to see the body They'll never feel that. She's gone. But there are hundreds of other things they will perceive from teachers that that bring them back. You know, people ask me, it's a funny thing, well, uh, who who do you think teaches the best? Or well, they'll ask me, I'll, I'll say I'm going to some studio somewhere, New York or Colorado or somewhere. Well, where did they get certified? And I say, you know what certification is really all about? They say, no, I don't know. Or who should I who should I go to? Who 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 should I go to who's been certified? What which school? I say, you know, if you go to a teacher and you feel like you are improving and feeling better. And you can't wait to get back there for two times a week or one time a week or three times a week. And you feel your body is, is better. You feel everything is better. You have certified your teacher. That's all you need. I don't care what's going on inside that studio. He or she is doing something that's very important. They're getting you back getting you to do stuff you would never, ever do. So that's all you need. Keep going. That's all. It doesn't matter whether you were certified by Balanced Body or Bassey or whatever it is, Michael King. Yeah, it's good to get that education. I don't think you can teach it without a lot of education. But some people can. I had a teacher in France. He, 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 he st- I think he went for two, three long weekends. He was an amazing character. He was a, a great martial artist, martial artist teacher. But somehow this captured him and he went and he got uh, certified in Marseille on two weekends. And he was as close to Joe as anyone I ever met. He had a great intuition about the body the exercises made sense to him in his mind and he he was great very little education tap really gifted other people could go for a million hours and not have that but all right so not everyone's going to be a you know great teacher and not everyone's as fussy as I am. But, you know, I, I, that's the breakthrough. That's why we are where we are today, because so many people want to teach this. I, I, I want to circle back now to something we we just touched on right at the start. Um, and I'll preface this by saying that I teach people to be Pilates instructors, and we ask all of our students what they love about doing Pilates. And by far, by by an order of magnitude, the most common answer is some version of it quiets my mind, it makes me happy, it's it's not just physical, it's for me, it's for myself. Um, and you end the book by reflecting on what it is about Pilates, about Contrology that is so special for so many people, um, what allowed it to, to survive Joe's death. And, and that and that's you know that specialness remained through Amana's and Ron Fletcher's creative interpretations, and and you know as you say it survives to this day in this kind of open source exercise routine that Pilates has become. So, 
Yeah, and and this really leads into the notion of flow that you uncovered. So can you can you talk us through what you th- you know what you see is so special about Pilates and and what makes and and I guess and tied into that notion of flow for me, please. Well, I you know it's, it's, that's a, extremely good, but very a challenging question. When I I wrote this book over a long period of time, not not that I dawdled, but I had a lot of trouble organizing it. I had a huge amount of trouble finding a voice that I was comfortable with. Uh, I I tried. I tried uh, third person. I tried all kinds of things, and 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 one of the things I did along the way, because I went to a lot of PMAs here and lectured to people, I would ask teachers, particularly ones that I knew knew were ver- very serious teachers. What is it about Pilates? What's at the core of this? What I got most of the time was it works. That was it. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's one thing. But there's got to be some that doesn't, you know, jogging, running works, uh, lifting weight works, bowling works, golf works to some extent. So, all right, so it works better than anything else. But people, you know, don't necessarily uh, realize that. And then I started to think about my experience. What, What happened when I was in that studio, even the very first time, maybe most noticeably the first time that made me say, I need this. What was it? And I I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I knew I had uh, uh, played in sports that required, uh, you know, your full concentration, tennis being one of them. Even golf, when you're for the hundredth of a second, you're addressing the ball, you got to concentrate. The rest of the time, when you're walking around, you can have a beer, you know, think about dinner or something, but you, you got to concentrate. But there was something about that complete concentration, that complete concentration that interested me. And then, I started to think about what are you thinking about? Why are you so concentrated? You're concentrated because you're trying to get your body to do something. You're you're trying to make your body do something, which you hardly ever do. When you want to walk, you don't think about it. You just get up and walk or get up from the chair or reach up for something on a high shelf or pick your nose. Whatever you do, you just ah, pick my nose, you pick your nose. But here, you didn't just pick your nose. You thought about picking your nose. You said, oh, I got to move my hand here. I got to do this. And you suddenly, even when you do that right now, touch your nose, you if you think about it, you can actually feel your muscles working. You can actually feel something, but only if you think about it. If you just do this, you don't feel anything, except when you hit your nose. But And that's what uh, kept me going. There's something in that connection, in that ability of the exercises to make you think about it, feel it. And that's, and I, I was just fooling around on the internet when I got to uh, Sisma High Lake. And, and I got the book right away. I said, holy, geez, this guy, he was incarcerated. He, he, he 
he was talking about taking your mind away from everything else. And that's when the thought of how what Joe did, what his insistence on one exercise to the other uh, without interruption, on no water, on no talking, on no music, on no anything, memorizing, was so similar to what uh, Sistan Mahali was talking about in flow. And that's how I made that connection. It's a theory. Uh, I'm sure other people find other reasons. Uh, but I, I still see it, even when they're talking, even when teachers are talking to their students about lemon meringue pie. The student is still, oh, all right, I got a little break from trying to get my legs straight and when I'm doing the one leg circle, but our student. One like circle. There's still plenty of it there. There's not as much in the isolated environment of Joe. But that wasn't a business either. And we need to have a business. Um, I find I find your thinking on that very compelling. It resonates a lot with my own experience of doing Pilates and also talking with with people. You know, I talk with a lot of people who love Pilates and like I said, that's that seems to be something that is the most common sort of that theme. And so if we agree that this this flow state, you know, the state where you essentially lose yourself in 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 the activity and you're mentally you you become quiet, you know, because you're so concentrated. Um so that you know, flow is the the the, the kind of secret ingredient or uh, more accurately probably the result of doing Pilates. Um, and we we know from uh, I'm going to butcher this name, but Chiksen Mihali. Um, Six uh, ten Mihali. I butcher it all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we know from his research that uh, a flow state, you know, where we lose ourselves in activities, um, is it happens when there's when you're experiencing high challenge and you have high skill. You know when you're working towards the limit of your skill at something that is very challenging and you're succeeding. Um, then when, so basically when you do something difficult using all of your concentration and skill, then it doesn't really matter what you do so long as it's challenging and you concentrate hard on doing it well. So this kind of leads me inescapably to the conclusion that the power of Pilates or Contrology doesn't actually reside in the specific moves themselves, but rather in the effort to perfect them. You know, it's it's not the what, but the how you do it. Would would you agree with that? Absolutely, it's all in the how. Yeah, yeah. If um, you you can ride a bicycle and watch TV, it's not the same. Right. No. So. So. So I guess, um, you know, from there, you know, uh, you know, here we are in this open source world where you can go to Pilates classes in one of a million locations and the people will be doing things that, you know, I mean, there'll be certainly themes, but there'll be vastly different activities that go on in those classes. But there's yet there's this one underlying commonality that that defines it as Pilates and so I guess um, you know what would you how would you define Pilates well I, I try to do it in the book and I don't want to go back on that but it is related to the insistence of focusing on the uh, uh, on your body in motion it 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 relates to that focus there's a lot of things in life that you can't put words on you just can't and uh it it's one of those things but the mechanics of it yes you can 
you're not doing a Pilates when you're playing tennis, but there is a flow uh, available, and that's what the great players are, are in that state. You could actually see it on their face when it's over, and they come up to the net, and all of a sudden, they, they have to get out of it because somebody on the other side is wanting to shake their hands or something. Uh, you can see it in a, a stage actor when they come out for a bow. Some of them are still in the state that that concentration put them in. Now, everything that requires concentration is not Pilates. There has to be a connection between a choreographed routine and that need for the concentration on doing the choreography. And that, what that is, in, in one other word, I, I, don't, I don't have it, but I think in, in, the, in the open... In, in the open session, yes, uh, you, you can look at you, uh, open code. You, you can look at, at what's going on. Now, if you look at yoga, you can also see a great concentration and a choreography, but you don't see the continuous motion. You don't see the... You see poses and stop and pose. So, well, that's not really Pilates. It's this very similar things. I mean, there's some poses that look exactly like Pilates moves, except the dynamics is so different. So, okay, well, that means there has to be some dynamism to Pilates, which there is a huge amount of that. You move things. You move the carriage. You move your body. You climb things. You hang things. You move your arms. You pull things. So there's, there's some dynamism to it. There's some... A detailed choreography. It's not just eh, pull a thing, pull a thing. No, you've got to stand up the right way. You have chest open. You have to breathe in and breathe out. You got to be. You got to be tuned into all this stuff while you're doing it. All right. Well, that's uh, yeah. That's another quality of Pilates, <laughs> and and you know, and this uh, this so, sort of feeling what's happening thing. You've got to feel it. You've got to somehow get your, uh, I don't, I don't know how to actually describe it. I know, for example, that when you start to look at certain things, uh, look for certain things like bird watchers. If you go out with a bird watcher and watch birds and you're not a bird watcher. They'll see a hundred birds and you'll see one. You'll just see one. Where is that bird? Oh, it's right. I don't see it. And that's what happens all the time. And then if you go out the second time and the tenth time and the hundredth time and you start going out by yourself, you start to see the bird you couldn't see before. Or fly fishing. You don't see what they see, fly fishermen. But they eventually see it. Hunters, they see a deer somewhere. And you go out with a hunter. Why is deer? You don't see the goddamn deer. But if you keep doing it, you see it. And that's another quality that I don't think you can describe. But it's, it's part of continuing to do this choreography. It's a tuning of your body. I mean, you're... Your eyes are the same, you're the same, the exercise is the same, but you're seeing and feeling and you're getting in touch with things that you didn't before. And all of a sudden, as you keep doing it, the teaser becomes real. Oh my God, look what I'm doing. Ooh, I, I can feel my body doing that. And you didn't before 
that's Pilates. Tell me what the word is and I'll be grateful. I wouldn't have to write a whole book. <laughs> in, in the book, uh, when you, you know, you're like, I guess I want to finish up by, by asking you, uh, well, first observing that, you know, you're now a, about the age or a bit older even than Joseph was when you first met him. And so it strikes me that there's a certain degree of symmetry in that, you know, now that you are, you know, you're describing, you know, yourself as this, I think, young 33-year-old uh, man, you know, meeting the Joseph Pilates at the age of 78 or whatever he was at the time. And, and I, you know, I, we see that, um, we see that interaction through your 33 year old eyes, but now you're looking back with your 80 some year old, you know, recollections of that. And so to me that there's a, there's some kind of symmetry to that, uh, journey. And I, I, I think your book is quite profound and I, I wonder now, like, you know, looking back and, you know, also with just the, the wisdom that's come with age, like what, what do you hope people take away from the book? Everything you did, period. If they, if they get out anywhere near what you've gotten out of this book, I achieved my, my purpose. If they understand or even question what there is about Pilates and why it's changed and how better to teach it and cue people and understand people and even understand the man that created it and tolerate things about him uh, and tolerate each other. Oh, man, I've written a hell of a good book. And no, really, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm touched by what you have gotten out of the book. And if, 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 yeah, if people get even a part of that, and I think they have, by the way. I've gotten so much uh, wonderful uh, feedback or whatever you call it. Yeah, I can, it's, uh, people, uh, some people have actually started to go to Pilates. I have a neighbor across the street. I gave her an advanced copy of the book. Whoa, wow, I'm going to go. Where can I go? I mean, yeah, you know, that's I, I, the other thing I, I did want to help the business. I didn't know, of course, about the trouble it was going to be in because of COVID-19, but it, it needs a boost now and then. It needs someone to kind of, say, hey, this is really great stuff. Go get it. And I, I think it's doing that too. It, it's surprising me how it's being received mm. well, nicely. It Good is surprise. a genuinely excellent book. And like I said at the start, it's it's just a great read, even despite, you know, the, the, the fascinating history of Pilates that you relate and the, the insights into Joe's personality um and if you add on top of that the multiple uh you know, surprising revelations at least for me um about you know parts of the the history of pilates that i had taken completely for granted like the bed springs for example <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that turn out to be absolutely you know untrue and what's more you know utterly ridiculous <laughs> but uh, i think it's it's one of the best books i've read in in the last you know several years i think and for somebody in your 80s writing your first ever book i think that's truly an astonishing feat so you've you've done incredible work and i think you're really making it you know going to make a mark on a lot of people and 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 uh have made the world a better place so thank you very much well it's been my uh, great pleasure it's a, a lot of fun to talk about this your questions were wonderful and uh i hope your audience you know really appreciates it and i hope teachers take a look at what it's at what it, feel good about teaching, but also take a look at what m makes it really work well. That'd be great. Thank you so Have much. Have a good John. time. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, 
I'm glad we made the face to face. Yes. Where are you, Raphael? I'm in Melbourne, Australia. All right. I'd like to get there. You're in you're in New York still? I'm in no, I'm in S- Santa Barbara, California. Oh. I haven't been in New York since 1989. Hmm. Well, Santa Barbara's not and too I'm far very, away. What? Well, it's closer to Melbourne. Away. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, take care of the Australians out there. And uh, there's a lot of Pilates there. There is. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Take care, Raphael. Bye.